Awesome. Um, so thank you to the Virtual International Day of the Midwife for having us. Today we'll be presenting on maternal and child health training for midwives, um, a framework for sustainable midwifery through continuous quality improvement. My name is Kathleen Fole, and I'm a graduate intern with Helping Children Worldwide. With me today is Yasmin Bond, Technical Advisor for Global Health Admissions with Helping Children Worldwide, and Mariama Masakoy gartman founder of Tenki for Born. For the last 24 years, Helping Children Worldwide has been working in Sierra Leone to address global health and child welfare. HCW also convenes a network called Together for Global Health, and the Together for Global Health Network is a co global coalition of individuals and organizations dedicated to promoting sustainable health care and wellness in low-resource communities. The network meets monthly to collaborate and share resources. Um, and the Together for Global Health Network members operating in Sierra Leone came together and decided to launch a joint project to address maternal health and health system strengthening. The goal of this project was to train 100 Sierra Leonean midwives on emergency obstetric and neonatal care. And we can go to the next slide, please. So in our presentation today, we'll share information on why organizations should start an upstream approach to maternal and child health by focusing on midwifery training. Then we will share more about the training that has been conducted by the Together for Global Health Network. And we will conclude with a short panel to discuss the, discuss the lessons learned from this training and share how other NGOs can implement these initiatives. Next slide, please. So why focus on maternal and child health? Um, the sustainable development goal number 3.1 targets the reduction of the global maternal mortality ratio to less than 70 per 100,000 live births by 2030. Between 2000 and 2020, the maternal mortality ratio dropped by roughly 34% worldwide as a result of targeted interventions and improvements to care. Research has shown that an effective way to further decrease maternal and child health or mortality uh, is through care by skilled health professionals before, during, and after childbirth. Next slide, please. So over the last 20 years, maternal mortality in Sierra Leone has dropped 74% as a result of the work of the Sierra Leone Ministry of Health, as well as local hospitals and clinics. However, Sierra Leone has an MMR that is still 100 times higher than the target set by the Sustainable Development Goals. Additionally, Sierra Leone faces a daunting challenge with its neonatal mortality ranking number one in the world with 78 deaths per 1,000 live births. The leading cause of maternal and neonatal death in Sierra Leone are all preventable with the presence of a skilled birth attendant. Sierra Leone has increased the number of trained midwives in the country from less than 100 in 2010 to approximately 1,500 in 2023. However, this still falls short of the international standards for midwifery workforce, which the target in Sierra Leone is 3,000 midwives. The Ministry of Health has made numerous strides towards filling the gap with midwifery schools in the districts of Bow, McKinney, and Freetown. Oh, if you could go back one slide, please. Thanks. Um, and through the establishment of direct entry training initiatives. While establishing midwifery schools is a crucial step in improving maternal health outcomes, the true impact hinges on the quality of training provided. Next slide, please. Over the last 20 years, maternal mortality has decreased by 34% worldwide, and the key to sustaining this trend is to create a workforce of competent and confident midwives. The future of midwifery is midwives who are committed to continuous learning of current evidence-based practices to provide life-saving and respectful maternal care. Organizations that work to train and empower midwives with education, support, and skills are investing in the sustainability of the midwifery health force because empowered midwives will have lower rates of burnout and workforce migration. Midwives are a key group to target for sexual, reproductive, maternal, newborn, and adolescent health as they provide 90% of the necessary care. However, midwives only account for 10% of the global sexual, reproductive, maternal, newborn, and adolescent health workforce. Recent research has emphasized the need for not just a larger workforce, but also a skilled and competent workforce. 
This evidence indicates that over half of deaths of newborns and half of maternal deaths now result from poor quality of care. Next slide, please. Oh, uh, actually, if we could go back one, I'm sorry. Is it this? Uh, back to... Yeah, right there is great. Sorry. <laughs> um, training and retaining a workforce of skilled and competent midwives could avert more than 80% of all maternal deaths, stillbirths, and neonatal deaths. Not, all, uh, not only does a skilled workforce avert more deaths, but a higher quality maternal health service has been shown to have a larger and more positive impact on utilization rates as compared to service proximity. Next slide, please. However, in many contexts, we see barriers to high quality training for midwives. These barriers include a lack of coordination and alignment between the midwifery stakeholders on a global, regional, and country level to align educational and training processes, a lack of resources and infrastructure, which adversely affects students' learning experience and limit opportunities for gaining hands-on experience, and a lack of investment in education when it comes to skills and knowledge around contemporary teaching and learning practices. In our training in 2024, we observed that educators were more confident with theoretical classroom teaching as opposed to clinical teaching practices. This is a result of many educators not having access to clinical settings or simulation tools to support competency-based education with women and babies. Next slide, please. Now we will dive more into our training experience in Sierra Leone. In January 2024, Helping Children Worldwide collaborated with six other organizations to host a five-day training conference on emergency procedures in maternal and newborn health in Sierra Leone. Next slide, please. Through the Together for Global Health Network, we reached out to our contacts at the Ministry of Health, medical supply resource organizations, donors interested in, in maternal health, and local partners to make this conference happen. Next slide, please. Altogether, 19 organizations collaborated to make this possible. The Ministry of Health provided national master trainers and recommended facilities for recruiting trainees, and other organizations provided advice on training, trainers, and materials and donors provided in-kind and financial support. Next slide, please. Our training was conducted using the Helping Babies Breathe Essential Newborn Care and Helping Mothers Survive curriculum. These curricula were developed in conjunction with JAPIGO, the World Health Organization, and the American Academy for Pediatrics with low resource settings in mind. The Helping Mothers Survive curriculum was focused on bleeding after birth complete modules that teach treatment for postpartum hemorrhage. And of note is that the HBB uh, is an adapted curriculum for, from NRP. The curriculum has knowledge assessments, but is primarily focused on skill building and is designed to be used with a high ratio of trainers to trainees. The curriculum is available free of charge online and simulators can be purchased from Lairdall. Our 98 participants were guided through all three tracks of this curriculum. Next slide, please. Evaluation was done for both knowledge and skills using pre and post tests, as well as ob objective structured clinical evaluation, which is uh, also referred to as OSCEs. We, enormous, oh, we had enormously high standards for our participants to reach in order to be considered certified and receive a certificate, and we were excited to see such high pass rates. Some participants had to be retested due to limitations with our trainers, but the majority passed on the first assessment. We also had a cohort of 16 participants who had been through this curriculum previously and were receiving training to become rising trainers. We're pleased to say that 12 out of the 16 were certified as rising trainers. Next slide, please. So next, we're going to transition to a panel discussion with Yasmin Vaughn and Dr. Mariama Masakoy gartman um, So thank you to them for being here with us today. Um, our first question is, we often see a gap between the skills learned in training and their practical application in resource-limited settings. 
What strategies can be implemented to ensure that knowledge and skills gained through training are effectively translated into improved patient care? Thanks, Kathleen, for that question. And uh, thank you to the VIDM for having us here today. Uh, as we talked about in the presentation, hands-on learning was one of the most important parts of the training. Uh, a few years ago in Sierra Leone, they did a survey of midwives and recently graduated midwifery students and midwife students, uh, and each of them identified a need for skills training in addition to the head knowledge they were getting in the classroom because they were lacking that experience training and mentorship and education in the field. Um, so having our trainers are, and are having our trainees go through drills of doing the procedures over and over again in real time was essential to being able to build that instinct and that muscle memory. As we know, any delays in recognizing problems and responding to them can mean death for mothers and babies. So building the competence and confidence, as Kathleen said, to perform these life-saving procedures is really vital. Um, secondary to that, it was also important to be able to take the time to understand the resource constraints and the experience of midwives at their facilities. So by understanding the access they had to like tertiary referral hospitals, drugs, supplies, transportation, it was easier to be able to create scenarios where they could picture this happening in their own context. Uh, so for example, there's a medication that's in the curriculum that is not currently available in Sierra Leone. And so we only talked about it for a short time, just in case that medication becomes available, then they have some knowledge of how to use it. But we were trying to focus more on what they actually had so they could see its application more readily. Um, also, more than anything, the one of the most important strategies to employ is the critical thinking skills. The curriculum may say to do A, B, C, and D, but if you don't have access to that, gaining the skills on how to improvise and think critically about what to do is key. Thank you, Yasmin. Um, so what content areas did you see participants uh, most interested in growing their skills and developing uh, those skill sets? So um, during the course, we went ahead and did a pre-knowledge assessment and a pre-confidence um, assessment to see what the participants felt comfortable with. And I think um, they felt comfortable with basic management, right, of the active uh, management of the third stage of labor. But um, what they were most excited to learn, I think, was the the new um, protocols that were put out for the Bleeding After Birth Complete course. So Japigo had just updated that um, in October. And so we were rolling this out for them in January. And um, in that new protocol, they had an emotive, which is uh, basically to, it's a mnemonic that stands for um, evaluating the patient and um, basically um, telling whether or not they're in distress. And then M is for massaging, O is for using ox oxytocic drugs, T is for TXA, I is um, for an IV, starting an IV, and then the other E is to evaluate for secondary causes. And so this was a new framework that I think uh, most of the participants were excited to learn because it was very automatic and it allowed them to be more proactive in uh, preventing postpartum hemorrhage instead of reactive. So those thresholds to um, initially start the um, activation for emotive were lower. So you're not waiting for a lot of bleeding for the woman to be really in distress. You're really looking for things like um, high um, heart rate, increased heart rate, low blood pressure, anything such as that that would activate that and then kind of take you down a, um, a standard procedure. So all of the participants seemed really receptive to that, wanted to learn that because, again, it's a proactive way to um, stop postpartum hemorrhage. Um, another thing that they were interested in is um, the NASGs or the non-pneumatic anti-shock garments. So that was another um, option during the Bleeding After Birth course and Healy International Relief Foundation um, brought multiple of those garments over so we could teach them. And essentially what that garment does is it provides compression outside of the patient on the aorta and it stops bleeding from, from the umbilicus down. So it keeps perfusion to your essential organs, your brain, your heart, those things for the mother to survive and it stops bleeding from the uterus. So all of the midwives got to have hands on with that. And then um, Healy International Relief Foundation left some of those there um, in the facility. So I think those were the two highlights that um, most of the participants really wanted to learn and were excited to gain those new skills. Great. 
Um, so how can we best leverage the knowledge and experience of lo local healthcare professionals and midwives when designing and delivering maternal health provider training programs? Yeah, so our training for context use both international trainers coming from Canada and the United States, as well as national master trainers from Sierra Leone. And the pairing of these two groups was important because the national master trainers knew the context, they knew the local languages, they knew the resources, the access, even local terminology for medical procedures and medicines and things like that. Um, and what they really needed support in, as we talked about earlier, was curriculum delivery, mentorship, and the actual pedagogy teaching aspects of the training. And so this is where our international trainers were able to come in and support them. So they really needed support in those areas. And our international trainers, of course, needed uh, better cultural awareness, um, having the ability to be able to visit clinics and see the context, and then having them both be able to spend time learning how to teach together um, was really important. So it's through the collaboration of these two groups that you have a really uh, qualified, good cohort of trainers. Um, I'll also share that local organizations played a really strong role in uh, being able to make this curriculum very tailored to the setting. Um, so local organizations selected which trainers would attend the conference uh, and really helped us tailor the program to fit well within the local context. So, for example, we originally were planning to do a two-week training, but we're advised to condense it to five days because midwives that were coming from smaller clinics may be the only person that's on duty for a while, and we did not want to take them away from their clinics for too long. Um, so recognizing the important voice that they bring to a table was a really big piece in our success. Thank you. Um, so how can we leverage creative training solutions to ensure effective knowledge transfer, even when access to most experienced trainers might be limited? Um, so part of our training or what was embedded in our training was a train the trainer program, right? So um, that was one way that we focused on um, providing an opportunity to have kind of that sustainability where we taught these trainers how to do the curriculum so that they didn't have to rely on us to be there. Um, I think another thing that we use and that's important is that um, while we went there in January and we did the training, we also realized that it's not really a one and done thing. So we have kept in, in touch with um, multiple practice coordinators. So basically those uh, participants that scored really high on their OSCEs that showed um, um, initiative and interest in helping their local facilities were designated as practice coordinators. And um, Tanky went ahead and provided training material and supplies so that they can continue that training in their um, local clinics and facilities. And every, every month we have a touch point of making sure that they're doing that training and keeping it up because we know those are skills that if you don't use them, you lose them. And um, that's another way to kind of make sure that that um, knowledge is transferred. The last way that uh, we've been focusing on that or the next way that we're going to focus on that is try to um, have another option in the fall where we can teach um, our trainers and those uh, master trainers more effective ways of teaching and educating because we know adult learning is a little bit different and sometimes requires to be more interactive, more hands on and provide um, our trainers with different skills so that they, they can be successful. Great, thank you. Um, so our next question is, what impact have you seen firsthand from this training program? Um, you've both spoken on it a little bit, but uh, just any firsthand experiences that you've uh, witnessed working with these trainers? Um, yeah, so um, I'll go ahead and say, so in these groups where we kind of follow them and monitor them, um, one of our rising trainers shared this um, incredible story, um, which is yeah, just incredible about um, how she was um, the only midwife there and had to go to a meeting for several hours. And so her maternal child health aide, which is kind of a lower level provider, had to cover the floor. And there was this postpartum patient that was bleeding a lot. Um, and so she instituted right the emotive and um, massaged her uterus. She gave her oxytocin drugs. And then um, she was still bleeding. So they went ahead and they looked at... Um, her placenta, which is something that they learned from the course. 
um, looked at the placenta and saw that there were pieces missing. And so went back and removed those pieces from the uterus. Um, they had also started an IV. And by the time our rising trainer came back, um, the woman was fine. She was stable. And the maternal child health aid, the MCH aid, gave her a report on um, everything that had happened. And what was just so wonderful and incredible about that is that um, our trainer, right, had felt, had empowered her team with these skills and they were able to um, save a life, right? And, and before that training, had they not received that training, that woman most likely would have died because they would not have known what to do. They wouldn't have had the midwife available. And so just to see how that trickle down effect happens and how uh, people can be empowered um, um, was really great to see. Really wonderful story. Um, so next question that we have is what role did collaboration play in the project and what were the benefits and challenges of collaboration? Yeah, absolutely. If I could give one piece of advice to organizations who are looking to increase the sustainability of their work, uh, collaboration is, is key to that. Um, so as Kathleen said in the presentation, we had about six organizations that came together to really be the, the core team on this, but it was over 19 organizations that collaborated to make this possible. Um, speaking for ourselves and for others a little bit, um, we really feel that we couldn't have accomplished what we did on our own. Uh, and by being able to work together, we were able to leverage strengths and resources to be able to do more. Uh, so Mariama and her organization, Tinky for Born, brought the curriculum expertise and the knowledge. They also procured the simulators for our training. Um, other organizations brought material resources together, and we were able to recruit trainers across a variety of organizations that had different expertises across the country that were really helpful. Um, additionally, we even had organizations that didn't necessarily participate with us. They didn't send a trainer or they didn't, you know, come to the conference themselves. But if they had experience doing this training, we consulted with them to determine if there were potential pitfalls to avoid, areas to leverage, things like that, so that we learned from their mistakes and were able to not uh, repeat them. Um, and if they were also planning to do a training, there was a few organizations that are doing training in Sierra Leone on this particular curriculum. Um, and so we were able to share with them who we trained, uh, where we were training and who we were planning to train next so that we can avoid this duplication of efforts and assure that we're reaching the right people at all times. Um, with collaboration, the challenges are, of course, just getting people interested in investing the time and money to partner with you. Um, in our experience, finding the right person or the right person at an organization to partner with is key. Um, so being able to find that one person who's really interested in the work that you're doing is already doing this and already has some stake in the work that's being done and getting them interested in just answering an email sometimes is, is the biggest thing. Um, we've also seen that asking for small things like, can you loan us your stimulators? Can you loan us some medical supplies? Can you give us the contact information for the medical supply organization that you get your supplies from? Um, and then getting them invested just a little bit in that way and then allowing them to see the success of your project shows the value that having a partnership with you would have. So we encourage everybody to collaborate. Great, thank you. Um, and our last question, uh, Yasmin shared a little bit about some suggestions and recommendations for uh, implementing this training uh, if other organizations are interested, but Dr. Uh, Masakoy, do you have any thoughts on that as well? Um, yeah, just to add on a little bit to that would just be, um, you know, we experienced that having a plan in place and like a detailed plan in place is really um, is really key, right? So making sure everybody's on the pa same page from day to day, hour to hour, just kind of having that framework so that um, the team knows what we're doing and what's expected, right? When you work with a lot of organizations, especially in different countries, um, different time zones, um, you really can't over communicate. Um, so having multiple meetings, um, having those opportunities and touch points, because we're all busy, we have um, different, um, you know, uh, pulling priorities. When you have more meetings, you can be assured that at least some of the people will be able to attend. And after a while, everybody will get the information that's needed. Um, and then also making sure that there are clear roles um, for each person in the organization, right? That everybody that is at the table understands what is expected of them, what's needed, and also that they have a voice to contribute what they think and what their, idea, what their ideas are, are in order to make it successful. 
um, finally, after all of that planning and meeting, um, you can be sure that when you hit the ground, there's going to be some changes, right? Like it's not, it's not going to be exactly how you planned it, exactly how you expected it. So just being flexible, right? Being flexible and understanding so that everybody is on the same page. And at the end of the day, the, right, the goal is to, is to, um, to translate knowledge, to help this be effective, and that we're going to make it work, right? We're going to roll with it and we're going to make it work. So I think at the end of the day, that flexibility and that teamwork um, is the foundation to be successful. Great. Well, thank you to our panelists um, for contributing some thoughts and, and wisdom on this. Um, but before we transition to any questions from participants, um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so for those who might be interested, we would be happy to share with you all our post-conference report once it has been finalized. Um, we would also like to invite any of you who are interested to travel with us again, either in October or January of next year. Um, we will be carrying out this training again in a new district within Sierra Leone, um, and we would love to have you. Um, next slide, please. So just wanted to say another thank you for having us today. Um, and thank you again to our panelists. And we would uh, be open to answering any questions at this time.